It really is a great pleasure for me to have been invited to be the president of the Holdsworth Club. Uh, I'm, I think, the tenth Master of the Rolls to have had the honour of presiding and addressing uh, this august body, um, or, and although mine is the eleventh lecture given by a Master of the Rolls. Now, that sounds a bit odd, but Lord Denning, who else was, in fact, president twice when he was Master of the Rolls, uh, and apparently he was also president before that, when he was a mere Lord Justice of Appeal. So three lectures for him. Uh, well, I'm not going to try and compete with that. I'm sure that all of my predecessors will have expressed their pleasure at being honoured with this presidency, uh, but I doubt whether any of them will have been able to say uh, that their spouse was here as a law student uh, and that she attended a Holdsworth lecture uh, millions of years ago. <laughs> And I'm pleased to say that she's here in the front row, uh, uh, coming to hear what I've had to say. Uh, I cannot um, vouch for her sense of excitement on this occasion. <laughs> in my address, I want to examine the compensation culture. This is something I imagine that W.S. Holdsworth, notwithstanding his truly encyclopedic knowledge of English law, uh, would have been unfamiliar with, unfamiliar with him. Uh, the term was apparently not coined until 1993, which surprised me. And it appear, apparently it appeared for the first time then in the Times newspaper article uh, by Bernard Levin, which was entitled Addicted to Welfare, and there is a, a clue perhaps for what's to come. Since 1993, the term has become ubiquitous. It has filled numerous newspaper column uh, head, uh, inches and continues to do so. I'm sure that you're all familiar with the types of stories in which that term features. They tend to involve the payment of large sums of money to individuals for seemingly trivial injuries. There was, for instance, a story that ran in June and July 2011 of a school pupil who received nearly £6,000 in compensation, and his hand had been burnt at school during his lunch break. The burn was the result of some spilt custard. Last July, a cleaner was reported to have received just over £9,000 in compensation for pulling a groin muscle after stumbling over a mop handle and falling over. And last November, it was reported that a teaching assistant <coughs> had received £800,000 in compensation, and she was said to have suffered a finger and elbow injury uh, after she had tripped over the waist strap attached to a wheelchair. Stories such as these give rise to the perception that something has gone seriously wrong with civil justice in this country. And in this lecture, I want to consider whether there really is a problem, and if so, what should be done about it, or whether there's merely a perception of a problem, and if so, why that should be, and what we should be doing about that. This is an issue which has certainly excited the media. Uh, but it doesn't simply exercise the media. It has, for example, featured in two government studies, one in 2004 and one in 2011. The, the second of those, you may remember, uh, was by Lord Young of Grafham, and it was called Common Sense, Common Safety. Uh, it was the title and the subject of uh, a parliamentary report and was the impetus behind the Compensation Act of 2006. It was also the subject of a critical study published last year by the Centre of Policy Studies entitled The Social Cost of Litigation. That study formed the basis of more newspaper column inches through a follow-up article by one of the study's authors, a Professor Furidi, in the Daily Telegraph. The article's title was The Compensation Culture is Poisoning Our Society, and that title left no room for doubt about the view that was taken in the study. Most recently, it has featured as an underpinning to the government's consultation on whiplash claims uh, arising from road traffic accidents. I'm going to come back to whiplash a little later. What does it mean, though, to talk of a compensation culture? The term means different things to different people. In 2003, it was defined by a working party established by the Institute of Actuaries. In these terms, the desire of individuals to sue somebody, having suffered as a result of something which could have been avoided if the sued body had done their job properly. Well, the problem with this definition is that it fails to capture the commonly critical meaning that the term carries with it. A desire to sue somebody who has caused you a loss 
arising from their blameworthy conduct is surely not unreasonable. In fact, that is the very basis of our law of tort, uh, and in particular the law of negligence. A better definition was the one set out by Lord Falconer, the former Lord Chancellor. In a speech that he gave in 2005, he defined the compensation culture uh, as a catch-all expression. It is the idea that for every accident, someone is at fault. For every injury, (coughs) someone to blame. And perhaps most damaging, for every accident, there is someone to pay. Here, then, is the crux of it. Compensation culture encapsulates the idea that for every accident, for every injury or loss suffered, someone other than the individual who suffers the loss is to blame. And to borrow the phrase, where there's blame, there is a claim. Uh, And there is always blame. Compensation is being being sought improperly because the claims do not rest on the application of any legal principles, such as the need to establish a duty of care, a breach and causation. On the contrary, they rest on the idea that all an individual need to do is to rush to litigation irrespective of, of the legal merits of the claim and the riches that will follow. The people can, uh, that this people can do because no matter how trivial, vexatious or spurious the claims may be, uh, they can afford to litigate because of no-win, no-fee agreements. Just as significantly, the potential costs to employers, businesses and so on of defending such claims are so prohibitive because of the uh, effect of no-win, no-fee agreements that they have no real choice but to concede claims uh, and pay up irrespective of their, uh, their merit. So as a consequence of this, the perception is that as a society we have witnessed a cultural shift No longer is British society characterised by a somewhat philosophical and accepting approach to life. The growth of compensation culture, uh, so it is thought, has seen a shift in this approach, with more and more individuals suing at the drop of a hat for any injury, uh, as the media reports are taken to demonstrate. More perniciously, this has been accompanied by a growing burden on employers, businesses, schools, the NHS local and central government of costs both in terms of the compensation that they have to pay but more more seriously perhaps the legal costs which often substantially exceed the amount of the compensation and all of this is also said to give rise to defensive practices on the part uh, of such bodies schools are said as a consequence of compensation culture to ban conquer fights in schools to ban playing football with leather footballs. School trips no longer take place, so it is said, and so on. There is, however, a problem with this picture. It rests on the central idea that more and more people are, in fact, claiming compensation. (coughs) The evidence does not necessarily bear this out. A study in 2006 by Lewis Morris and Oliphant concluded that there had, in fact, been no real increase in personal injury claims since 2000. The parliamentary inquiry, which reported in the same year, uh, concluded that, quote, evidence, the evidence does not support the view that increased litigation has created a compensation culture. Most significantly, the BRTF report, which was published two years earlier, concluded that the very idea of there being a compensation culture was a myth. That report drew, amongst other things, the following three conclusions about the compensation culture. First, it encompassed a perception that we are becoming more like the United States in that more and more people are suing others for large sums of money and often for what appear to be trivial reasons. I want to return to this point. Secondly, this perception is in turn fed by the media and claims management companies which encourage people to make such claims by creating a perception, quite inaccurately, that large sums of money are easily accessible, said the report. Thirdly, this has created a, quote, real problem. In the words of the task force, and I quote, it is this perception that causes the real problem. The fear of litigation impacts on behaviour and imposes burdens on organisations trying to handle claims. The judicial process is very good at sorting the wheat from the chaff, but all claims must still be assessed in the early stages. Redress for a genuine claimant is hampered by the spurious claims arising from the perception of a compensation culture. The compensation culture is a myth, 
that the cost of this belief is very real. It has got to be right that people who have suffered an injustice through someone else's negligence should be able to claim redress. What is not right is that some people should be led to believe that they can absolve themselves from any personal responsibility for their actions and then expect someone else to pick up the pieces when something goes wrong. End of quote. So we're left with a conundrum. There was, and still is, as Lord Young's 2010 report and the government's recent whiplash consultation makes clear, a perception that there is a compensation culture, and that perception has real and negative consequences. That perception is not, however, as grounded in reality as has been suggested. The question for me today is to what extent can the perception be challenged through an examination of the operation of the justice system? But before I develop this further, I need to say something about claims for whiplash injuries and road traffic accidents. Now, that is a very topical subject, as probably all of you know. And um, on our train journey up this morning, I, or perhaps more precisely, my wife, um, uh, I should say, found an article in today's Times. And uh, it is so relevant that I must read a little bit of it to you. The government plans to reform whiplash injury insurance claims will be put to the test over the coming months. The Influential Transport Committee is to confirm today that it will undertake a fresh inquiry. The cross-party group of MPs will call for written evidence about the Coalition's proposals to tighten oversight of the injury's diagnosis and make it easier to test suspect claims. As it makes clear its view that whiplash claims, including fraudulent ones, are quote, undoubtedly, I quote, driving up the cost of insurance, motor insurance, the committee will lay out five key points that the inquiry will examine. These will include whether the government was right to dub Britain as the whiplash capital of the world. (laughs) Well, that's a fairly extravagant claim. Um, It is the case, however, that whiplash claims have risen by a a third in the last three years to about 550,000 a year. Staggering, even though the number of accidents during that period has fallen. Jack Straw suggested setting up independent medical panels to assess the claims more closely, and that's now been reflected in this government consultation paper. Uh, He said, There were a handful of whiplash claims before 2004. It is only since these claims companies have sprung up that they have grown. The people of England and Wales now have the weakest necks in Europe. (laughs) The Ministry of Justice consultation paper said that whiplash claims contribute to the high cost of motor insurance and the perception of a compensation culture. But it is important to distinguish fraudulent claims from what what I'm really talking about. I'm talking about the question whether there is an expectation in our society that for every genuine injury there must be someone to blame. I'm not talking about fraud. Regrettably, there will always be dishonest people who seek to profit um, out of fraudulent activity, and such activity is by no means confined to the world of civil litigation. And it is certainly not confined to whiplash claims, uh, although that seems to be a fertile ground, as we now see, uh, for um, uh, fraudulent claims. At one stage, for example, there was an epidemic in Liverpool of claims against uh, 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 against the local authority for damages for injuries suffered for slipping on pavements. For some times, claims have been uh, made for stage-managed car crashes involving so-called crash-for-cash criminal gangs. Uh, That's all about fraud, and that's not what I'm really talking about this morning. So, to return to what I am talking about, one of the underpinnings of the perception that there is a growing compensation culture is the view that we're becoming more uh, American. That was the BRTF report's uh, understanding. In some ways, this is perhaps not surprising, given the influence which the United States culture has had over us during the last 50 years and more. The ubiquity of US television programs, literature, films, Facebook, is as remar- unremarkable now as the opening of the first McDonald's was un- uh, remarkable in October 1974. Uh, we didn't always have McDonald's in this country. It's perhaps <laughs> e- easy to forget that. <laughs> we're all familiar with, or at least might think we're familiar with, the US legal system, 
from Perry Mason. I don't suppose any of you have heard of Perry Mason, but um, that rather dates me. But anyway, Perry Mason to LA Law, Boston Legal, and so on, on uh, television and innumerable films. We know all about contingency fees, punitive damages, and civil jury trials in the States. We're equally likely to believe that the States is the home of compensation culture, with individuals being only too ready to issue spurious claims and receiving startlingly massive awards of damages. The view that we're going down this American path has certainly informed the view of the media. A couple of examples highlight this. The first is taken from the Daily Star newspaper, not what I read every day, I have to say, <laughs> um, and not perhaps most reliable, but anyway, uh, November 2003. And it, uh, it was cited in the BRTF report. It was a comment, comment by Vanessa Feltz. <laughs> well, I thought that might produce a few titters. <laughs> she said, We live in a compensation culture. Everyone's running scared of litigation. Terror of being sued means it's only minutes until pavements are painted with gigantic government warnings in case we catch our stilettos in a crack and sue the local council. And overpaid cafe lattes will carry huge labels lest you burn your tongue and slap a writ on, on them like the American plonker who gulped her McDonald's coffee and then took Ronald McDonald to the cleaners. <laughs> it was good stuff. <coughs> Another example, again 2003, Daily Mail this time. I won't say more about Daily Mail. <laughs> he said, the claims culture and the compensation culture have taken root here. It is not as bad yet as in the United States, for which we should be grateful. McDonald's had to pay out for not telling a customer the coffee she bought and then spilled was hot. But a similar claim here was tossed out, because coffee is meant to be hot. <laughs> that, is, that is as nothing, however, when compared with the Winnebago case, where the driver left the wheel of his mobile home while his vehicle was speeding down the freeway and went into the back to brew a coffee. <laughs> with no one steering, the vehicle crashed. But the owner sued successfully because no one had told him it was unsafe to leave the driver's seat when doing 70 miles an hour. <laughs> well, the, these examples are actually very interesting. They both paint a vivid picture of litigation yielding massive and seemingly unjustifiable reward for the individuals who, who made their claims. They also make the point, which has featured in the, re featured in the recent criticism here of our compensation culture, that the claimants seem to have lost all sense of personal responsibility. The two examples, however, repay more detailed scrutiny. The Winnebago case, its central premise was that a driver got up from the wheel of a speeding motor car um, to go and make a cup of coffee. The aspect of the story not told is that the driver was said to have wrongly understood that his new motorhome's cruise control operated like a plane's autopilot. Switch it on and it drives itself. The manufacturer's alleged liability was based on its failure to put a warning in the driver's manual that cruise control was not an autopilot device. The owner apparently sued the manufacturer successfully for a sum in excess of a million dollars, and the manufacturer changed the owner's manual to incorporate a suitable warning. Well, most people would react to this with, with sheer incredulity. How could a court find in favour of a claimant and make such a massive award of damages? Surely this is the very epitome of an unjustifiable compensation culture that enables individuals to absolve themselves from all responsibility for their own actions, no matter how ridiculous, while foisting liability on, onto someone on whom any reasonable analysis could not be to, to blame. We would all tend to agree with that, uh, if that was where we were heading. Uh, then not only would a compensation culture have taken hold but we would surely, as a society, have lost our grip on reality. The problem with this case is best summed up by another newspaper headline, this time from the uh, United States itself. The problem, as described by the LA Times, is that the story was a, quote, complete fabrication. It was a myth, and one that in numerous guises has apparently been retold since uh, the early 1980s. So much for the Winnebago case. It simply was um, untrue. What about the spilled coffee case? Most of you have probably heard of this case, which, as reported in the media, involved a woman who sued McDonald's because the coffee was too hot. She had bought herself a cup of coffee from a drive-through McDonald's, 
uh, and uh, it's funny how McDonald seems to keep coming up, uh, and was driving along with the cup placed between her legs. The coffee spilt all over her legs, burning them. Rather than chalk this up to experience or think how stupid she was to place the hot coffee that she had bought between her legs whilst driving, she sued McDonald's, and so the story goes, she won her claim and was awarded millions in damages. As with the Winnebago case, we can see the clear outlines of a compensation culture here. It shows an individual passing the blame for an apparently trivial event onto a third party, a third party who could not, in a reasonable world, be viewed as responsible. <coughs> Something surely has gone badly wrong here. After all, coffee is expected to be hot, and driving whilst resting hot coffee between your legs is hardly a sensible thing to do. It should be obvious that there is a real risk that if you do that, you might end up stopping sharply and spilling the coffee. In such circumstances, it should surely be almost inconceivable that McDonald's might be expected to be liable in compensation. That in this, that in this case it was liable, and for what must be a massively disproportionate amount of compensation, surely shows, so they runs the argument, that something has gone badly wrong with society and the legal system. Given that it is hardly surprising that Theresa Graham, who led the Better Regulation Task Force's litigation team, was able to note in 2003 that, quote, everyone says that litigation has got completely out of hand in the United States. But again, we need to look behind the newspaper story. The case was Liebeck and McDonald's. And the, the real facts were that in February 1992, Mrs. Uh, Reback was sitting in the passenger seat of her nephew's car she was not, as the myth had it, driving. The car was stationary. She had placed a cup of McDonald's coffee between her legs in order to hold it, still while she tried to take the lid off. The coffee was hot. She had purchased it only uh, moments earlier. What Mrs. Liebach didn't know was that the coffee had been heated to between 180 and 190 degrees. The coffee spilt as she was trying to take the lid off. It soaked through and it was absorbed by her trousers, and she suffered third-degree burns to various parts of her body. She was in hospital for eight days, had to undergo skin grafts, and was partially disabled for two years and permanently scarred. So Mrs. Liebach, she didn't rush to the courts. She wrote to McDonald's asking if they would pay for her medical costs and her daughter's lost wages. Her daughter had taken time off work to look after her, and she asked for a sum of between ten and $15,000. Um, in fact, McDonald's offered her $800. Six months later, she hired an attorney and she sued. Uh, and her cause of action w was based on a strict, strict liability on certain statutory provisions. It wasn't, in fact, a negligence claim. She also sought punitive damages on the basis that she alleged that McDonald's had known that the coffee would cause serious harm and it was irrecklessly indifferent in its approach to the welfare of its customers. In the US, civil claims, as you probably know, are generally still heard before a jury. Members of the jury are reported to have commented that they were insulted to be asked to hear such a case, that the claim sounded ridiculous, and that they were being asked to waste their time on a cup of coffee. Well, their view obviously changed during the trial, since they found that McDonald's was liable, albeit with 20% contributory negligence uh, on Mrs. Uh, uh, Liebach's part. They awarded $160,000 in compensatory damages for the burns and the disability and the scarring and $2.7 million in punitive damages, which was intended to represent two days' uh, uh, profits earned by McDonald's, McDonald's on its coffee-based activities. Now, we, we, of course, in this country, we, we, we wouldn't all, uh, award punitive damages in, in that way or, or, or at all, but the the level of the compensatory damages is perhaps more interesting and more relevant. In fact, on appeal, the award of punitive damages was reduced uh, uh, to $480,000. The claim subsequently settled uh, for an undisclosed sum, uh, one assumes for a sum rather less than the amount awarded by the court. So, it became clear at trial that McDonald's knew that there was a problem with its coffee because lots of claims, I think 700 claims, have been brought against them for um, burns as a result of their uh, unreasonably and excessively hot coffee. So that's the context in which this story needs to be viewed. 
So when looked at in this way, it hardly seems a genuine case of compensation culture gone mad at all. It wasn't a trivial case, but one of severe injury. It was not based on negligence, but on a form of strict liability, where the claim was in fact supported by the defendant's own evidence. The claimant had not rushed to the courts, but only litigated after her request for modest reimbursement had been rejected. So the two American examples that I've given, when considered in more depth, present a picture markedly different from the one presented in the media. One story was fabricated, and the other was in truth fundamentally different from the reality. Uh, as, as for the McDonald's case, it is a mythical picture that somehow caught the imagination in the United States as a consequence of deep-rooted political arguments in favour of reform of its tort law. Well, this isn't the place to consider uh, whether these arguments are justified. There are no comparable political uh, um, arguments here concerning our substantive law. There is no clamour for reform of our product liability law or the tort of negligence. I suggest that the reason for this may be because, with very limited exceptions, juries do not decide tort claims here. And our judges, and I suppose I would say this, wouldn't I, our judges adopt a measured and sensible approach <laughs> in applying the principles of tort law which have been crafted and refined in the crucible of the common law over a very long time. But I can illustrate this by referring to our own English uh, McDonald's coffee case that was tried here in 2002. That was a case called Bogle and uh, McDonald's. Uh, it was dealt with by Mr. Justice Field, uh, and he dealt with a series of preliminary issues arising out of a number of claims that were being dealt with under a group litigation order. <coughs> there were 36 claimants. Most were children aged between 4 and 16. Uh, they had brought separate claims against McDonald's arising from distinct incidents in which they had suffered, each suffered personal injury in the form of burns caused by spilled hot drinks. Uh, and it was specifically hot coffee sold by McDonald's at about the same temperature as the coffee sold in the Liebach case. Factually, then, the claims were similar to the Liebach claim. Claims also raised similar legal issues to those in, in issue in the US claim, uh, although this was, uh, this was a, a negligence claim. Uh, um, uh, um, amongst other things. One issue, for instance, was whether the coffee cup lids were a poor fit, such that McDonald's had been negligent in using them. Another was whether they'd sold a defective product under the terms of the Consumer Protection Act of 1987. The claim also raised the question of whether McDonald's were negligent in dispensing and serving hot drinks uh, at the temperature which they were served. Just as in the Liebach case, so here it was clear, as Mr Justice Lee uh, Field put it, that there was a risk that a visitor might be uh, badly scalded and suffer uh, a deep thickness burned by a hot drink that is spilled or knocked over after it has been served. If, as was suggested in the media a year after this case was decided, we were on the way to a compensation culture, the result of this claim ought to have been a foregone conclusion. But in fact, the claimants failed on all issues. McDonald's uh, was held not to have been negligent in serving coffee at high temperatures. Its cups and their lids were held not to have been constructed negligently. It was held not to have been a breach of consumer protection, in breach of consumer protection <coughs> provisions. On this basis, it ought to be reasonably clear that if the Liebach claim had been brought here, it too would have failed. This case raises a number of issues, the role of the media and the difference between substantive law and procedure. Looking at the role of the media first, the report summed up the central problem with stories such as those relating to the U.S. McDonald's case. It concluded that, quote, many of the stories we read and hear are, are either are simply not true or only have a grain of truth about them. A false perception is created. What would the two more media stories have looked like if they had included a reference to Burgle and McDonald's? Rather than present a picture that we were on the way to a US-style litigation culture, the opposite point uh, would probably ha could probably have been made. The stories could have made the point that in the United States, uh, this type of claim tends to succeed, whereas here it fails. In the US, the story could have been, there is a rampant litigation culture. Here there is not, 
because the courts applying our law uh, uh, of negligence uh, dismiss uh, such claims. It is not too difficult to imagine an entirely positive account being given of the robust nature of our legal system and our substantive law, a positive account which, rather than perversely encouraging frivolous claims by presenting the view that such claims are likely to succeed here, will properly reinforce the view that litigation is not a route to easily obtain compensation. Given the ease with which the Bogle case could have been used to exemplify why we are not heading towards a US-style compensation culture, the question arises why, why it was not. A similar question arises in respect to the numerous cases that are reported and reported as showing that we are in the grip of the compensation culture. At the heart of most of these cases, such as the ban on conquer playing at school or the ban on sack races at a school sports day, lie claim that this is all because of health and safety. Uh, that's almost become a term of abuse or derision. But in most cases, as the health and safety executive is at pains to point out, health and safety legislation is irrelevant. The sack race ban, for example, had nothing to do with health and safety. The race didn't take place because the teacher concluded that there wasn't enough time to fit all the events in on the day. Something had to be sacrificed, and uh, it was the, second, the sack race. The conquer example rests on a misunderstanding of the law by a no-doubt well-meaning head teacher and is described by the health and safety ex executive as a truly classic myth. So the media find a silly decision and they build a whole edifice on a, a silly decision. Health and safety serves as a useful scapegoat and makes a good story in the same way that the Winnebago case uh, makes a good story. It plays a role which a proper understanding of the law would not let it play, would not have let it play. The sack race story, if reported properly, could, like the Bogle case, have been used to highlight how we are not in the grip of a compensation culture. The race could easily have gone ahead if there was sufficient time. The Concaban story, if it had been reported in another way, uh, could have been used as in an educative way to highlight how there had been a misunderstanding as to the legal position. In both types of case, rather than adopt a position of unthinking criticism, uh, a more reasoned position could have outlined that we're not in the grip of compensation culture. Perceptions could have been shaped differently to match the reality. Of course, stories written in that way would not have been new, uh, as newsworthy as those which were written nor would they have fitted nicely with the notion that our society is being undermined by overzealous regulation in the field of health and safety, the growth of the nanny state, EU regulation, a rights culture, and the depredations by fat cat ambulance chasing lawyers. All of these are bete noire of the media. I, I suggest that such good, good news stories would simply not be written. The Bogle case raises another issue the difference between substantive law and procedure. Uh, it, uh, the, the Bogle case failed on the basis of a sensible and conventional application by the judge of well-known and well-understood principles of law. It was not an isolated example. Uh, a couple of examples will, will illustrate what I mean. The first is the well-known case, which I, I expect you've all of you studied, uh, of Tomlinson and Congleton Borough Council. Uh, John Tomlinson, uh, the claimant, uh, one hot bank holiday weekend, uh, decided to go for a swim. He and his friends were in the local park. They'd been there many times before. In the park, there was a flooded quarry, sand quarry, which had been made into a nice place for families to sunbathe and paddle in the water. As it was such a nice day and he was hot, he decided to dive into the water to cool off. This was not the first time he had done this, Tragically, however, he hit his head on the bank of the on the bottom of the quarry. He broke his neck, and as a consequence, consequence was left as a as a tetraplegic. He sued the local council. The, ha the case went to the House of Lords, where it was rejected. In rejecting the claim, Lord Hoffman reiterated the point, which the media should have in mind when they consider whether we are heading towards, or indeed are in the grip of, a compensation culture. What he said was this. 
The law does not provide such compensation simply on the basis that the injury was disproportionately severe in relation to one's own fault, or even not one's own fault at all. Perhaps it should, but society might not be able to afford to compensate everyone on that principle, certainly at the level at which such compensation is now paid. The law provides compensation only when the injury was someone else's fault. So to succeed in his claim, Mr Tomlinson had to establish that the injury was, as a matter of law, attributable to the fault of someone else. Basic elementary stuff, you might think. That is what had to be established in the Bogle case. The law requires fault. It requires a duty of care, breach and causation of loss. These are not always straightforward matters to establish. The courts have uh, certainly not taken an approach which has lowered the standard of care, made it easier to establish negligence, or introduced a test which allows claims to succeed in the absence of fault, except where, of course, the law requires and imposes strict liability. For a compensation culture properly to take hold, there would have to be a major shift in our substantive law, as neither the Supreme Court nor Parliament not least in the light of Section 1 of the Compensation Act of 2006, as neither of them appears to be moving uh, us towards such a realignment of the substantive law, it does not appear likely that we have in fact laid what would be one of the uh, a, a true foundation for a compensation culture. Our courts are very aware of the dangers of contributing to a climate of encouraging the idea that anyone who suffers an injury must have a remedy in damages. The judges apply the law rigorously. If I may be forgiven for mentioning a case which I tried many years ago now, it concerned a mountaineering accident. The deceased uh, had uh, hired a mountain guide to guide him up one of the peaks in the Mont Blanc range in the Alps. He had never climbed before. The two of them set off, and because the deceased was inexperienced, they made very slow progress. It was a very hot day. They should have started earlier than they did. In order to get out of the line of falling rocks, which had become detached from the ice by the heat of the sun, the guide took a shortcut. Uh, and in order to try to get um, out of the line quickly, uh, he uh, uh, took a, a certain shortcut in uh, his approach and hammered one, only one belay. Those are those things you hammer in to the ice to attach a rope to, to from which you can then climb up. Uh, I, I hope you get the idea. So he hammered in only one belay into the, into the snow instead of two. The belay came out, and uh, tragically the deceased fell to his death. His widow brought a claim alleging that the guide had been negligent. The case became before me, and I heard a good deal of expert evidence, um, in particular on the question of one belay versus two belays, uh, and I concluded that the guide had failed to meet the standard of care to be expected of a competent mountain guide. I was acutely aware of the fact that mountaineering is an inherently dangerous activity, and that, that accidents will inevitably happen without negligence. I went out of my way to explain this in my judgment, and to say that I had concluded on the evidence uh, that on the facts of this particular case there had been negligence. Despite my best efforts to explain my decision, my judgment provoked some criticism in the media. I was said to be an out-of-touch judge, more at home in the leather armchair of my club. <laughs> uh, I, I should say that I've never belonged to a club. But, uh, anyway, more at home in the leather armchair of my club, lacking in understanding of the realities of outdoor pursuits and dangerous, dangerously contributing to the disappearance of excitement in life. <laughs> In other words, a real, ki a real killjoy. <laughs> well, I mention this anecdote because, although I found for the widow in that case, I really do not believe that it can be said that my decision made a co contribution to compensation culture. Well, now, I see the time, and I've been given strict instructions to stop after 50 minutes. So I'm, I'm now going to cut out a, a chunk of what I've, what I've written um, and hope that... Um, I can move seamlessly, if, if not, un, if not uh, unnoticeably, uh, to the end. Uh, as you can see, it's certainly not unnoticeably. Um, but here we are. Um, so where does this leave us? 
Well, I doubt very much whether we're likely to see, in the medium term at least, any reduction in news stories expressing concern about our compensation culture. We're likely to be hearing about compensation culture for some time to come. It is something of a mystery to me why the, mis- why the media find the compensation culture such a fascinating subject. As I say, I leave fraudulent claims on one side, and that is, I fully understand that, that is grounded in, in fact and in reality, is a matter of huge concern to, uh, to uh, anybody and should be. Um, but so far as I'm aware, uh, the media do not suggest that insofar as there is such a culture, uh, the judges are responsible for it. And as I have said, uh, such a suggestion would be, in my view, totally unjustified. It is true that conditional fee o- agreements, and I haven't had time to go into all of that, but I, I am sure you, you know in general terms uh, what they are about. There are really no win, no fee agreements, uh, such that um, a claimant who brings a claim really stands, uh, stands to lose nothing by giving it a go. That is all about to change after Easter in a, a very, very important reform to our civil justice system. So, as I say, it is true that conditional fees have encouraged the rise of claims companies who sell claims to lawyers and have encouraged lawyers to seek out as clients anyone who has or may have suffered an injury to make a claim. It is also true that defendants have tended to settle claims because they perceive that it is cheaper to do so than to fight a battle in court. And that is a a worrying feature of our current system and it's one which I hope that the new reforms will do something, at any rate, uh, uh, to remedy. I think that the reforms to litigation cost and a continuing uh, robust approach to the appropriate use of um, alternative dispute resolution, which again I haven't had time to go into, will go a significant way towards removing any improper incentive for individuals to pursue claims lacking in merit on the basis that through fear of costs a defendant will simply buy off the claim. All of this may also require a substantive educative effort on the part of government, the courts and the legal profession to counteract the media-created perception that we are in the grips of a compensation culture. It may also require greater public legal education. Given the possible benefits to society uh, through reducing the perceived need for businesses, local and central governments uh, and so on, to engage in unnecessarily defensive practices. Uh, I hope that that this will all pay for itself in the end. Perhaps, though, the only sensible conclusion to to draw is that if you want a definitive answer to the question whether and to what extent compensation culture is fact or fantasy, you might be advised to ask the question of my successor when he or she becomes the 11th Master of the Rolls to be your president. Thank you very much. (laughs)